Hey, everybody. I think we are ready to get started. We have a good uh, group of people in the audience. We have a great panel. Uh, welcome to uh, the first installment of the Multilingual Fall series. Uh, my name is Jonas Ryberg. I'm with Pactera Edge. I'll be moderating this today. Um, this uh, started as um, a white paper from, uh, from Pactera Edge and uh, NIMSA Insights on uh, uh, global customer experience. Uh, and uh, we found the topic intriguing. Uh, so we thought that it would make sense to share some of the findings from the white paper, as well as get input from a panel of experts uh, in the industry on, on this topic of lovable global customer experience. Uh, so before I introduce the panel, I wanted to share a few uh, data points uh, from the white paper. And by the way, we'll make this white paper available to everyone attending today as well, I believe. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, but through the data uh, in the white paper, we found that uh, companies that localize user experience see an increase of 100 to 400% in sales in local markets. So uh, knowing which markets are more sensitive uh, to localized user experiences can inform how to allocate localization budget for maximum ROI. Um, we also found that users uh, buy in English all the time uh, out of necessity, uh, but online storefronts in their own language can seal the deal for the 70% of customers who report that they're hesitant to spend without the localized experience. And uh, finally, we found that localization drives user conversions. So nine out of um, uh, 10 report that they would be more likely to purchase a product or service localized for their market. So obviously all this data really shows the importance of having a, low, a lovable global customer experience where localization is one part, but there's much more to it. So we wanna try to uncover some of the aspects of that, some of the data points, some of the uh, strategies that you can use uh, to create that lovable uh, customer experience. Uh, but let me introduce the panel. Uh, so I'll start from the top alphabetically. Uh, first, I want to introduce uh, Adriana Grande. Uh, Adriana is a user experience designer and localization specialist at Roku. Uh, she combines her skill sets to create unique experiences for the international user, in addition to expanding brand awareness uh, in the global market. Uh, next, we have uh, Mimi Hills. Uh, Mimi brings her skills and experience as a leader in the high tech sector. Uh, as both advisory member of CodeChex and former director of product localization at VMware, uh, where she oversaw the localization operations for products, services, and documentation. Mimi just retired from VMware this week. Congratulations, Mimi. Um, and then we have Pedro, uh, Pedro Gomez. Uh, Pedro is the principal, uh, principal program manager lead at Microsoft Search Ads and Use. Uh, where he drives a feature roadmap that grows users, engagement, and revenue across the globe. Uh, Pedro is also the chairperson of the Globalization and Localization Association. And then finally, uh, we have Pushpinder. Pushpinder Lobana heads up uh, customer research uh, for global content at PayPal. Uh, she focuses on creating impactful customer experiences by understanding cultural nuances in language attitudes and meaning. So, Great panel uh, for this topic. Welcome everyone. I appreciate you taking the time to share your insights in this area. So we want to start by defining customer experience to make sure that we're all on the same page. When we met before this uh, webinar, we found that there are certain aspects of this that is, is important to highlight. If I start with you, Pushpender, how do you define uh, customer experience in your scope? Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, you know, for us, customer experience means creating very cohesive end-to-end -end experiences for our customers as they interact with the brand, uh, the product, the features, and the services. And you know, when we say end-to-end, -end, we literally mean at any given point as they interact with your products and features, you're creating that lovable experience, that experience that resonates for them. Um, and this could be your marketing pages, it could be your product, uh, you know, live product experience, it could be the support that they get when things go wrong. 
And it also includes all the communications we send them, right? Text messages, emails, et cetera. And so what we do at PayPal is that we ground our customer experience in starting with the customer. We learn about the customer. We focus on what is it that they need? What makes sense? What's culturally and locally relevant? What are their behaviors and attitudes? What's the meaning behind the language that they use? So that all those insights actually inform the practice of UX design, content design, and our localization at PayPal. And just to give you a sense of the, the you know, drilling down a little bit on that. Um, so in my role in the global content and technology team, um, this means that we deliver those experiences in the right language, in the right market, with the right tone of voice, using the right terminology, and also using culturally relatable and uh, relevant icons, illustrations, photography, because it, it does go beyond language. So that's how we approach and how we perceive customer experience at PayPal. Got it. Thank you. Um, Mimi, would you add something to this? Is it different to you, or do you look at it the same way? I think that Pushpinder just gave a great description of the whole thing. In, in my world, what we've mostly focused on is the product. We're looking at the product interface and the documentation and how that plays into it. I think one of the things I'd like to uh, point out is the trend toward inclusive language right now as a way, not just, so we're looking at that. I mean, I mean the industry is looking at that in English for the first time, I think opening up their eyes to it, which is a wonderful trend. And, and we're extending that into the, um, the localization of it as well. So just another aspect where I think people are thinking more broadly about that customer experience, what it means, how do you not offend people <laughs> while you are trying to make that experience more lovable? Okay. And if we narrow it down a little bit to what positive customer experience is, um, and I'll, I'll ask Pedro in this case, can you share any benefits that you've observed in your role in positive customer experience? Sure. At the end of the day, you know, a positive customer experience is one that helps the users achieve what they are trying to do with uh, as little friction and as little entanglements as, as possible. When that happens, you know, the users are going to be using your product more often, which results in better business metrics for you and your organization. Uh, if you look at my product, my product is a, a, a content and search experience. So what we actually do is we look at uh, the consumption and the engagement with the product, and we are tracking this uh, throughout all of the different features. And this, typically we have a very strong correlation between the content that we present to the users in the different markets and the usability of uh, the, the, the site or the applications. So the more uh, that uh, those, that content is customized to the uh, context of the user and presented in their own language, the more that we see uh, adoption of uh, the product. At the end of the day, you know, you always have to begin with the end in mind, you know, what is it that you're trying to achieve and put yourself in the shoes of the users, build users for the users, and then that translates into direct KPI improvement for your organization. Got it. Um, so Pushbender mentioned uh, a fairly wide scope end to end, and we talked about a lot of different aspects here, um, both what it is and, and the positive aspects of it. Um, Adriana, when we talked, Previously, before this webinar, you mentioned that you would like to really highlight the fact that customer experience is one thing and user experience is something else or part of that. Can you talk a bit about how you see uh, customer experience and user experience uh, relating to each other? Sure. In fact, uh, user experience is an older term than customer experience. Uh, if you look at the Norman Nielsen group, Nielsen Norman group, they define user experience as what encompass all the, the aspects of a person interaction with the company services and products. If you think about it, the term user experience came about when they were 
incorporating human uh, computer interaction into the field. So it was more about the contact direct of a person and a computer. And that expanded and um, it was kind of renamed, uh, the whole experience was renamed as customer experience. So we, we now see many that say customer experience is what uh, Bushpin beautifully defined is from the beginning introduction of that product or company or brand to the user until the final interaction with the product. And now many call UX, user experience, that final interaction between the user and the product. But all in all, it encompasses the good experience that someone may have with a product, a brand and a product uh, and, a, um, and a company. So um, those things go together. They used to be one. And, and the truth is they're still kind of part of the same umbrella and they should all work together. Okay, great. And another aspect of that, uh, we're doing this obviously in the multilingual uh, fall series uh, is localization. Uh, and I talked a bit about localization when we mentioned the data points uh, ahead. So um, if I go back to you again, Pushbinder, can you talk a bit about how uh, customer research in your world impacts content and localization mm -hmm. decisions? Yes, uh, so you know, uh, in my role, um, I'm responsible for gathering insights in the 28 languages that PayPal is offered in globally. And, you know, customer research is a very integral part of the global content and technology team at PayPal. And we've built act actually a practice now of research, social science research with data science. And what we, we aim to do is to take insights when we blend those two views, we take insights and we channel them back to our linguists and our localization team, as well as our content design team who's actually building the source uh, experience, the source content. And what we're driving in our team is a data-driven approach. And I like to say data, but I actually wanna say insights because sometimes data by itself may not give you insights. It's the combination, you know, of different sources. Uh, it may be qualitative data as well. So, you know, we're really driving our team, our content and uh, localization team to adopt a, a, an insight-driven approach to making decisions about which terminology to use, what words will work in which market, how do you approach the value prop messaging that the brand has, uh, has laid out. And I'll give you a couple of examples just to give you a sense of the impact that this approach has had on our teams. So for instance, in Japan recently, we conducted a research study with our Japanese customers who use PayPal to understand what did they think about the PayPal tone of voice in the Japanese experience. And um, you know, we had heard some feedback from our Japanese business partners that said that our tone of voice in Japanese so it's very formal. And so rather than going with one person's opinion, we were like, let's do some research. Let's talk to customers who are actually the ones experiencing this. And our research showed that, um, and this was quantitative and qualitative. And basically our research showed that Japanese customers think they prefer uh, an informal, polite tone in the PayPal experience. And they want that infused with empathy and uh, confidence and enthusiasm, which are the three, uh, three aspects of the PayPal tone of voice. So they want that informal, polite tone infused with the right emotion at the right time. And what that research has done now is that it has, you know, it's going to make us rethink our, our style guide. It's going to make us think about our Japanese localization approach. Right. Uh, so, you know, these are the kind of insights that we, we take from the market and we, we funnel that back into our content creation process and our localization process. And then one additional example, because I'm, I'm nerding out on research here, bear with me, but uh, one additional example um, is on grammatical gender. So Mimi's point in the beginning of the panel, she spoke about inclusive language, right? And we are all about that. And so for us, it's like, are we perpetuating bias through the language we use? 38% of the world's population speaks a gendered language where the noun is either masculine, feminine, animate, inanimate, or, or other, right? 
And so we've had to take a hard look at our approach to localizing a gendered language. And a couple of languages that, that we're doing research on are Polish and German. Um, and, and we're approaching this from the perspective like, you know, are we doing the best we can uh, in terms of our approach to how we localize a gendered language? Are we inclusive enough in the way we localize? So those are some examples of how our research practice has actually transformed how we approach localization. So uh, Adriana, if I, I turn to you again, so you, you're both a UX designer and a localization expert. Have you seen any other examples or ways of working with the localization team as a UX expert or team? Um, yes, and I have seen some that has not been my work, but something that I had investigated and also uh, informally researched. But um, it, the bottom line is that you, you want to create that experience that talks to the user as if this was created for them, for their own language and for their own culture. And um, both Mimi and Pushpinder brought this up. It's very important to have inclusive language. And there's a lot of that that still doesn't happen. Um, I uh, am Brazilian, so I speak Portuguese. And my, my language is one where um, we use gender for um, people and objects and, and everything and everything and everything kind of varies according to number and gender. So it's, it's going to be hard for us to, to get to that point, but it's something that is of value and needs to be done. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to bring about when talking to kind of following up what Pushpinda said is that there's tremendous value when you localize that experience. Um, because it's not just the translation. A lot of people think that localization is the translation. One of the things that I, I observe is that currently, or at least in many companies I've seen, is that the current process has UX and localization in the opposite end of the, the, the product creation process. And these should be close together. Um, because when you are creating them together, when you give room for localization to be close to UX and vice versa, then you have a chance to catch design flaws or things you may have not thought. You can conduct user testing, even informally in those multi-languages and find out the kind of insights Pushpinder just mentioned. You get feedback from your developers and your linguists and other people involved in the company. Uh, you get ready to launch your product in multiple languages because you kind of weeded out a whole lot of problems that can come if you leave localization to the end. And not only that, you lower the risk of having lower uh, errors in localization and redesign. Um, and I have seen that in, in many projects that I have worked. So to have that positive impact, you need to think about what is the cost of not doing this the right way, right? If you, what if happens when you push those too far apart and then wait to see what happens? So what is the cost? And then analyze this and then maybe decide, well, it's time to put those two together and then save from a lot of, of costs and problems that will absolutely happen. If I can jump in there, I think you bring up a great point, Adriana, and, and without sharing uh, specifics, um, recently we conducted research where, you know, to, to your point about how do we bring it together, right? How do we take the UX and the product world and bring it together because they actually, you know, inform each other, right? And mm -hmm. you can catch, you can catch problems upstream instead of downstream where it gets very painful. You know, so we did a research project because we realized that, you know, in in the way our, our onboarding process is, is set up for our merchants uh, globally, there were some pain points and frustration. And it was all related to content in terms of the terminology. So how we call certain roles in certain businesses, right, the owner, the shareholder, you know, uh, the CEO, those kind of terms that we, we led with that were simply localized to those uh, markets weren't working. 
And so we had to go back and sort of bring the product team into it and say, let's do some research. Let's look at these markets and understand from a terminology perspective, do these, do these terms even make sense? Not only from the perspective of how businesses are structured in these countries, but how do people perceive the role behind this term, right? What are the functions of the shareholder, the owner? And it was, it was amazing because we were able to simplify the, 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 the you know, source experience, the product experience based on these insights and actually drive business impact because we ended up simplifying to a set of terms that made the most sense to these customers. And that led to a much better onboarding experience and less friction, which in turn led you know, to that business number that you really want to see at the end of the day, right? Like that's how you show you know, proof in the pudding, right? The, the, the business uh, impact. So just to, to your point, you know, we need to integrate the product world with the UX world so that we can actually work towards that same goal. Good point. I want to pick up on something else that you mentioned, Pushbender, earlier, uh, talking about uh, you, you focused on, on Japanese or the Japan market in one aspect of your research. So I want to, given the fact that the data that we got from this white paper about increasing sales 100 to 400 percent and so on by doing that, um, I want to ask the rest of the panel as well if you measure customer experience for each market, and, and if so, what, what data would you track for, for those parts? Yeah, so I can I can take this question, uh, Jonas. So if you if you look at my product, Microsoft News, it's a it's a very widely used product, and we look at that. What is the the business impacts? You know, we typically have over 550 million users every month uh, who come to the product from 180 markets, and we make the product available in uh, 31 languages. The other data point that we track is our position versus other multi-platform news sites in the world. According to Comscore, we are number one. So we do have a lot of metrics about you know, the business impact of the product. Now, what we do is that, uh, and the advantage of this type of online product is that uh, in the past, traditionally, you build product in a box, you put them in a store, and then you got some feedback from users maybe a couple of years later. Now, with an online digital business, you're Actually, you, you instrument the, the site and the experience so that you can see what users are reacting to or what they are not enjoying uh, real time. Uh, and this gives you a tremendous amount of information that you can use to refine your product. Now, clearly, uh, data and privacy is a very, is a very sensitive um, topic. So, you know, in our case, before collecting any data, we either do it through transparent voluntary feedback mechanisms where the users have got an option to come to us and say, hey, you know, we have a problem with this particular area of the product or with this language or market. And that is something that we look at in every market and we react to as, as needed. And then alternatively, we also look at uh, fully anonymized usage data. So what we do is that through telemetry, we can see what uh, content and what features are resonating with, uh, with uh, users that we can then uh, accumulate or slice and dice at different levels. You know, do we buy entry point, buy market, buy language? And this allows us to, to begin to see macro trends that we can that we can incorporate to inform some of the future product decisions. Now, one thing that we do all the time as part of, um, of being an online product is that uh, we're always running experiments. At any given point in time in our, in our uh, digital products, we're running tens of different experiments uh, where we typically create a default experience and then some treatments that we measure against our default. And what we find is that, you know, we're all very, very smart, very hardworking people. And we, we come up with a, with a bet that we believe will make the product better. But typically what we find is that the majority of our experiments yield the results that we had not anticipated, which is always a great data point. And you want to do this uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in as quick a, a way as possible so that you fail fast, 
learn from your your uh, explorations and then incorporate them to make the the, the product the product uh, uh, to make the product better in the future. Now, to do this, we have, as I said, a fairly sophisticated instrumentation uh, system that runs throughout the site. Uh, and then we create scorecards that look at, let us look at uh, you know what uh, people's enjoy or don't enjoy about the, the product and we typically look at the actions that people take on the site do they click on the content do they scroll on the page do they interact with our menus or dwell time how long they they stay in in in, in our product and we also that gives us quantitative information about the, the product and then we also look at the qualitative information like uh, what is the feedback that uh, people give us verbatim from the markets and when we look at all of this, we actually um, take uh, culture and market situations into account. You know, if you if you look at user feedback, some markets typically give you very positive feedback, no matter what you do. Other markets uh, tend to be more critical. So you have to be you have to be mindful of what is the 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 cultural makeup of the of the different countries. At the same time, you know, you always have to look at the uh, um, what is going on at the market at the same time that may give you a false signal in your experiments. For instance, we had uh, China uh, on holidays for the best part of one week uh, last week. If you were running an experiment or if you were looking at your user engagement metrics in China uh, last week, you would have seen a tremendous drop. And if you just by looking at the numbers alone, you wouldn't be able to explain it. So having that understanding of the cultural in uh, geoeconomic background of the markets is a great, uh, a great uh, um, supplement to understand how users are engaging with the product. Other thoughts? So, oh, you know, I don't wanna... oh, Okay, go ahead, Mimi, sorry oh, about that. Oh, I, um, I, I was just gonna say that I, I think that's really interesting. Um, at, at VMware, we experience an extra level of complexity in that so many of our products are handled through partners and resellers. And so the instrumentation that if we deploy a product, we might have um, about the end users, we don't necessarily have it. And so working with our partners, interviewing them, uh, asking them for data, which they guard very closely, not just for, um, well, for competitive reasons, as well as for legal reasons. Um, really, really super important. So I think Pushpinder, at one point you mentioned it's qualitative data as well as the quantitative data. We, we really have to look at everything. And we do use this to inform localization as well, because we, we all have limited budgets. I wish we didn't. <laughs> I wish we could always do the right thing in every language. Um, but but there are places where we know that localization might be, uh, that higher quality might be more important. And so um, getting it uh, getting it right is more important in other places. Time to market might be more important and getting it done quickly is very much more important. And so all that data has to be balanced and brought into to the picture in, in terms of how we localize those customer experiences. I think those those are all the kind of things that we we as well um, you know track um, you know all the stuff Pedro you mentioned A/B testing qual and quant uh, just to add though to the picture you know so for us we understand that every market is different and that the the questions or the ways we we measure customer experience has to adjust to the market a little bit that said uh, we do have. Uh, you know, there are industry accepted standards, you know, there, there are single metrics that can be taken as, as a way to get a signal of where there may be a problem in which language. And to mention a few, you know, the net promoter score or NPS is one that a lot of brands use, uh, but we've moved away from NPS because we think that it's not, it's a brand level question versus a content localization quality question. So we've moved towards um, a customer effort score, which is also an industry accepted standard. It's a CES, it's a five point uh, scale. 
And essentially, it gives us, think of it as a signal. That's all it is, right? Because you want to triangulate data from different sources to really zero in on where the problem lies. And so we see our CES at the high, you know, altitude where, you know, it gives us, gives us a sense of which market, which language uh, there may be an issue in terms of the ease of use uh, of completing a certain task, a certain, you know, experiencing a certain feature. And then we, we complement that with um, a data uh, view in terms of behavioral analytics. What are customers actually doing on the site, right, in these markets and in this language? So we complement that with behavioral analytics and also customer self-reported ratings, right? So we'll, we'll pop up surveys in the experience, uh, you know, where we ask them, you know, how rate the tone of voice, rate the content quality that you just uh, experienced at the end of the task. And so all of those data points help us triangulate um, information that then becomes very actionable for our teams. And so our data scientists have created data dashboards where we've trained our linguists and our design team, our content team, to go in and, and, and explore, you know, check the languages, check the scores, check the ratings. And, um, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of success with that model. I would like to add something to it. Um, the more I hear from you guys who have uh, deep experience in, in this area too, I, I hear a stronger reason from, for why should we start this earlier in the process? Because a lot of these things can be found in, in the ideation and the, the research uh, stages of the product creation. Of course, none of us are in a, in a, in a sense in a business that is starting up. But when we start looking at those things way early in the process, then we have chances to figure that out and, and tailor our style guide and tailor all the things that we already know about the user expectation of that locale. And then when it comes to the time of, of tracking this data, we will not be surprised with things that were not working. Because if we did our homework all earlier and we're not working in silos and UX in this corner, thinking about the design and localization in this corner, thinking about this, but we are collaborating and we are working together. Then what happened is that when the product is released and we are looking at this data, we'll see better results. We'll see better engagement. We'll see uh, more user satisfaction, right? The consumers are happy. They are buying, they're using the product. And this is all because of that big cycle that has to happen. So I keep going back to the point that the earlier we put those two together, the better we'll see, better result we'll see towards the end. Like how amazing it is to, to look at your data and see that all things are falling in place. And it's like, what a great satisfaction. Right? This is a great sign that the work has been done early. Um, and I think that a great thing is that you build trust with the people, whoever they are, whatever they are, you know, users, independent where they are, if they are happy and they trust your brand and they trust your product, they will be your ambassadors. And then that will just bring more business. So there's, there's no negative in, in doing those things earlier on and working them together because that's what we all want. Um, and a lot of those things we'll find out on, instead of finding them later on by data, finding, oh, why this data is not reflecting this way? Let me go back and find out. This is also a way to do it. So I guess the million dollar question is that how do we put UX and localization to work together, right? So there's different ways to do this. Um, ideally, you know, the mythical world of perfection, we would have figured that out day one and we would have the budget, right, Mimi? We would have <laughs> all these things kind of working together. But the reality is that it doesn't always work that way. Things just happen. So whatever you are, what can you do to make this happen and to, to work in such a way that later as you're looking at the data, you have the best data you can get? Yeah, and I think that's a great point, Adriana. And I think that the way that I'm, uh, I like to think about this is it's a, it's a bit of a virtuous cycle. You know, we have the opportunity to learn about stuff and do better in the future. 
and it starts at the beginning you know when when we have an ideation phase for a product you have to be thinking about you know is this product going to be successful worldwide do i need to make any adaptations talking with the spec owner with your program manager do we need to make any adaptations to the functionality to the content payload so that this product is successful worldwide so you inject yourself into the ideation phase then when it comes to execution and um code development. Typically, from a, a globalization point of view, we provide two types of services depending on the organization. You do the localization of the UI strings and that you want to automate as much as possible. And you may also want to do um, uh, international software internationalization uh, consulting because there are some areas of software international, internationalization such as the right to left uh, thing which are the gift that keeps on giving. And frankly, many developers don't work on this stuff every day, so they need to be trained and educated. After that, you go into the deployment phase. You know, your team, and uh, whether you're a vendor or an FBE at, uh, at any of these organizations, can help make sure that the product is properly accessible from the market in the languages and with the content that you expected in all of the languages. From that point on, you go into, um, uh, into more of a maintenance mode where you collect data about the product, you look at the feedback, both quantitative and qualitative analysis, as we were saying, and that actually spans new ideas that uh, feed the next ideation. And this allows you to create a cycle where you make, make the product better and better over time. And you also build that, uh, that uh, trust because you become the go-to person for uh, this part of the product with the engineering teams. Pedro, one of the things that you're saying really resonates with me, and it, it almost sounds a little bit like what we're saying in diversity and inclusion areas, that we need to be each other's allies. And we're coming from these diverse groups, we're coming together from different areas, and we're in complete agreement with each other, <laughs> that, that, you know, the, the UX, the customer experience, the localization, we have to be each other's allies. I think I've been fortunate in my most recent role that I also had the um, the technical publications team in my group, and we became each other's allies and could uh, fight for each other and always bring. If only one of us was in a product team meeting, we could easily represent the other team. It's it's really important, and so it's not about us being there all the time in every meeting because that's really hard, but learning about each other's fields and representing each other and say, oh, you need to talk to Pedro or Adriana or Pushpinder. <laughs> it's not just me. And, and just to uh, end that note with, um, you know, my work in customer research would not be successful for a global company like PayPal if I didn't work closely with our linguists and our localization team. I do not speak German or Polish or Japanese and, you know, I'm coming in from a, a, a social science perspective. I'm interested in language, culture, and technology. But at the end of the day, I'm not a linguist. And, and I have to work very closely on every research project with our linguists to identify the nuances that can, and down to the survey questions, down to what we ask our customers in these, um, in these research studies. So I think the, what we're doing the best here with this panel is that not only we're advocating, but we are open doors for other people who are listening to, to this to, to understand a little bit more and become informed and want to learn more and continue to advocate this. That uh, even though we work in silos in most companies, we still can be each other allies and we can still uh, bring in the points that Mimi said. We, we need to know who is who and who knows what. And we need to incorporate these people in the conversation, or at least if we don't need to be in all meetings, but um, we need to know where we are and who, where are each other's strength. So like Pushpinda said, uh, I go and talk to localization. Where I'm localization, I go talk to UX. And um, as Pedro mentioned, we may not be in the beginning of the product, but there is a cycle. So even if there's just a new feature coming up, how are you gonna name that feature in English? Well, what if you bring the, the somebody from localization to see what is the impact if I call this feature, you know, X name, 
Will that be something that will work? And then bring somebody from UX, or how will this work in the UI we're presenting this? Uh, do we need to think about space? So there's all these conversations that need to be happening and not divided in, in silos. They have to be together at some point. So um, the way I think this could work is that we could have either conversations formally or not, uh, meetings. Um, we could have somebody to represent the department to go talk to these other people, or we should at least be aware because uh, not everybody, like Bush Pina said, will know all languages or will be a linguist and will work in UX or will work in, in content writing. We need to be our best allies. In fact, I, I tend to tell everyone that I know that UX and localization needs to walk hand in hand because we should be our best friends. We should be working together because together we make the best product and we make our customers and our users happy. Great. Total agreement on the panel. I love it. So one, one aspect here that I think is important. So you're talking about getting sort of upstream and addressing both the, the global customer experience and localization in general early on, right? Getting part of the ideation and design phase. Um, I think one way to address that would be to highlight the ROI, right, of, of local uh, adaptations. Have you seen any good data around that or approaches to establishing potential ROI? Yeah, so if you, if you look at, if I may, if you look at uh, my company, Microsoft, we have a mission to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Part of that uh, uh, gives us a, a, a global ambition. And, you know, we tend to look at uh, language and culture adaptation as another flavor of accessibility. You know, you typically think about accessibility as uh, making products usable for people with, uh, with a disability, whether temporary or permanent. But if you don't have access to information in a language that you, you can understand, then it, it presents the, the same type of barrier. So typically for, for my product, you know, all of the UI elements are, are uh, translated. Uh, that's uh, fairly standard. Now, the interesting thing about my product is that if you, we are a news, a news product. So uh, UI represents a very small part of what we do. We actually had to come up with content which is sourced locally. So if you look at the, uh, Microsoft News in the States, in Canada or in Japan, um, even if the language is shared, the uh, content comes from a different local source. We have over uh, 1,200 publisher partners worldwide, which equate roughly translating to 4,500 uh, different brands. So if you're looking at uh, you know, any topic, for instance, a, a soccer match, and I'm a fan, and we have had some uh, European championships this, uh, this uh, last week, you, know, you can see the same match, basically the same event, covered from uh, from two different angles and we had to go through the effort of actually reaching out to the publisher partners in all of those markets so the ui is translated the data is sourced locally and then in some cases we uh make a uh, some ui adaptations uh depending on the market typically japan uh is uh, the sweet spot because they are a fairly large market and they typically have a different UI, UX representation. So if you look at uh, uh, our product in, the, in, in Western cultures, we typically like a very minimalistic approach where you have a lot of uh, white space. In Japan, we had to experiment and validate that the higher content density uh, it drives more engagement. And that's something that, uh, that we do now. You cannot uh, adapt every product to every market in, in a scalable, efficient, and economical way. So typically, we look at the ROI. And ROI for us is typically uh, defined as, you know, do we get uh, multiples of the investment uh, by way of uh, additional engagement from the users? Or we may look at some other um, opportunities where we have uh, 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 the possibility of actually significantly growing the users or aligning with an, an other 
initiatives that uh, the company has as part of the, as part of the strategy. So we will use those criteria, uh, dollars, users, and alignment to decide how deep we go into the market. And again, if you look at our product, in some markets we have a dedicated native experience. In other markets, we fall back to a culturally suitable uh, substitute because there is no no ROI for us to, to invest in them. I, I echo what you say, Pedro. I, um, one of the ways that we've been able to show ROI is by example. So there's nothing better than a new product in a new market. And so when we've done an acquisition and say the Japanese team says, if you localize, I can't tell this, but if you localize this, I can, I can sell X million. <laughs> <laughs> and we say, okay, well, it's going to cost you 200000 to localize. We think that's a pretty reasonable ROI. <laughs> so uh, we, we show that kind of ROI and then we track it over time. And then that becomes the example. And, and while Japanese is a, a great example, it's, it's just one market, but it's a prime market. And people are often willing to start with that. And then when they see the return... They, they go on to the next language. Um, we'd rather have, the, have people do all of our seven languages all at once, but it's a great way to get people started. And having that, that example is, is a prime, um, a very nice way of showing that it works. So uh, being mindful of time, uh, great conversation so far, but let's shift gears a little bit and look at some maybe advice uh, for the audience. So um, what about pitfalls? What, what type of challenges have you run into? Do you have any good examples of things that people should be aware of and, and try to avoid? I can take that one. Um, you know, we were, um, just as to an example that we, um, we uh, learned about a market more closely and uh, it informed our localization process uh, very much, which is uh, India. So we had a product team that was uh, getting ready to uh, release a feature in India in 12 languages. And they were going to just use the traditional approach, you know, localize it to 12 languages, take the US source experience and translate it to those 12 Indian languages. You know, when you think about India, it has 1.3 billion people and there are 23 official languages. And there's incredible complexity in terms of culture and how people interact with technology and all of that. So we made a case with the product team that we needed to understand this market, even if it's a couple of languages that um, in the Indian context, to really um, you know, shape our approach for this very key market. And we ended up going in with a couple of assumptions which were proved wrong. The first assumption was that uh, we assumed that people with low literacy in English or limited literacy in English would not be using apps in English. And that if we offered the app in their native language, they would use it. And that assumption you know, fell apart when we actually did ethnographic research with customers who use apps like Google Pay and Amazon Pay. And we found that people with low or limited literacy in English are actually preferring to use those apps in English because the native language in the digital translation is too complex and was written in a very old fashioned, complex, uh, you know, not conversational approach. And so people who are even very literate in their own language in Hindi or Malayalam uh, chose to use the apps in English. And it, it, it was just a, really an aha moment for us that, you know, what is, what, is, what is not being delivered through the localized experience that this is the scenario, right? And uh, so we ended up actually finding some great insights on how people actually, you know, they use a combination of languages. You know, that's how they talk in everyday life. You know, we need to think about localization approaches that mimic those everyday conversations that are more colloquial um, and, and things around consistency and, you know, what, what words we use in the UI and how simple we keep it. Um, and, and it really actually helped the product team 
understand the value of, of, of customer insights to inform the localization. I want to bring a new example to going for uh, what Spinner said. Uh, I'm working on a side project for a Brazilian TV news channel. Um, and one of the things, like, we, we sometimes have perceptions of people. The Brazilian people are perceived as a very playful people, very uh, laid back and, and fun kind of people. However, in certain topics, if you want to, to, to evoke that feeling of trustworthiness, you have to have a level of seriousness in your tone. Otherwise, they don't take you seriously and then you become like a gossip column, right? They will not think that you are, uh, you're worth their time. So it's in interesting because you have to go into the culture and, and it's not only just going into the language because understanding the culture and understanding who you want to reach and what you want to get from them, it also needs to have that understanding what are their expectations. Right, uh, like uh, you have to to find out up to what point you need to be serious and formal, and uh, how much can you afford to be casual and friendly. Uh, one of the examples that I uh, I saw in my last travel to Brazil last year, and everywhere I go, I'm doing kind of case studies as I observe everything around me because I haven't lived in Brazil, and so for so long and I wanna see what changed. So I, I take notes of everything and then I ask questions. One of the things that I noticed is that um, in the last 30 years, the, the tone and formality that financial institutions bank uh, talk to their customers are still the same. So even though you can walk into a bank and playfully talk to somebody, when you go through the UI of a bank, it's it has a very formal tone still. Um, they, they, they talk to you as sir and ma'am where no one in Brazil will talk to you as sir and ma'am, but that's the expectation. And that means, well, if they are dealing with your money, they are taking you seriously and that build trust. So the bottom line is that they want you to see them as they want to be seen. And that takes insight. Um, and that's when it's not only important to know the grammar and the structure of the language as a linguist. That's when you really need that, that study of, of the people. The ethnographical studies um, are super important. User testing is super important because those are the insights you're only gonna get through qualitative data, not quantitative data. Okay. Point. Uh, so, I go ahead, maybe. So, go ahead. I'll just uh, quickly mention a couple of other kinds of pitfalls I think that people have run into um, from not considering the end-to-end -end customer experience. So in one case, um, it was it was not even about language. It was simply what point in the cycle do they calculate the tax? And it didn't work for every country. So that was one way to do it. Another time um, when I worked for BlackBerry and a matter of the device, uh, BlackBerry was huge in Indonesia, but they ride around on their scooters and they hold their phone in one hand. And if you have an app that needs two hands, people aren't going to use it <laughs> because it, they they have to be able to, just, you know, hopefully they're at a stop sign and they're quickly <laughs> entering something in their in their phone. But there, there's so much about the end to end customer experience that's really important to to understand country by country. Great, so I wanted to stay on the topic of advice. So if you consider someone who's just entering into a decision-maker role for, for globalization or localization, what should be their first couple of actions to address the global customer experience? I think if I, if I may take this one, if you, if you think about, um, uh, if I think about myself 20 years ago, um, you know, three things would come to mind. I think that uh, in the industry, we tend to spend a lot of time talking about the, the activity that we perform and not the impact that we drive. At the end of the day, we do all of these things because we're helping uh, companies reach a global audience. So it, uh, it is beneficial for us to talk about uh, the opportunity that we can unlock through these activities, 
rather than the details of the execution. There's typically a lot of discussion about details of execution, and that makes people see you as a cost rather than uh, 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 as a growth driver, which is going to engage a different uh, uh, conversation. And in doing that, you know, one thing that I would say is use the, the industry resources. So uh, Pacteria and Ninzi have got this great uh, piece of research that you can share with your management and say, hey, you know, it's not me just telling you, it's uh, industry uh, experts telling you that you have an opportunity to expand your, your, your global opportunity. Then, I would also uh, encourage people to think beyond translation. You know, uh, beginning with the end of in mind, if you're trying to drive more engagement and user growth globally, what else can you do across the world to make sure that uh, new users learn about your, your product, find the product, they try it, they buy it, they use it, and then they get support in their, in their uh, local market. And then finally, uh, my pet peeve is to, to treat English as another language and ENUS as another market. Uh, part of a, a continuum of markets rather than the, the first product that then gets translated, adapted, and localized internationally. You know, at the end of the day, you're trying to reach the world, all 7.5 billion of people. English and the United States are two big markets, but they shouldn't be driving the entire conversation. You should be thinking about this holistically and be market and language agnostic when you're designing your experience. That's what I, I wish I had known 20 years ago. Um, Those are uh, such excellent. Okay, I'll pause. Go ahead, Paul. Actually, no, 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 Adriana, you go. You can go first. I was just going to say a good a good practice to have is to ask a lot of questions. Um, in localization, we may not be trained to ask a lot of questions, right? We receive text, we react to it, but um, that's when my UX training comes to hand because we before we do anything, we ask questions. And those questions may lead to sometimes another direction, but it, it always leads you to what you need to know. So before you write anything, start asking questions about that people and that culture and that language, um, their behavior, their frustrations, their expectations, uh, what do they already know, what they already used to, um, what they are connecting with, what is successful, what is not what is missing. So there's so many questions that need to be answered. And those questions are not questions that have to be asked only in the beginning. This is a never ending process because uh, using a UX word, uh, iteration, you should be doing this over and over again. Um, in fact, you should, every time you get data, you should ask those questions again and see if that is still the goal, if you're still reaching all the goals you want, or should we have higher goals? What should you do to get um, to higher goals? What, what this leads to an ask, what, what doors are being opened? So I think questions are uh, something that we should start practicing and, and get better at asking questions. Agree 100%. And the other thing that I'll add to that is ask questions about the product because a lot of us handle many, many different products in our, in our jobs, and each one of them may need something different. So ask questions about the users, about the culture, and ask questions about the, the product. You wanna add something, Pushpinder? <laughs> All, you know, everything that you all have said, I echo, um, you know, completely. I think the one thought that was coming in my mind is, you know, uh, become an advocate for the customer in your team. Be the voice in the room, um, you know, that asks those questions as the linguist, as the localization expert. You know, you're working possibly with, you know, a U.S.-based team. I'm making a huge assumption here, but, uh, you know, the product manager for that product is, perhaps US based and may not be thinking about all these nuances, but as the localization expert, as the trans, uh, linguist, you know, take it upon yourself to become the advocate for the customer. Ask those questions upfront and, and, and get a seat at the table. You know, ask, when, when can I see the creative strategic brief on this one? You know, tell me exactly how this product is gonna work. Uh, elbow your way in. I mean, I think this is where like, we just have to advocate for ourselves and our customers, because no one's going to do it uh, other than you. 
Can I just add something to it? Another thing that I just thought is that get to know your product really well. Know the ins and outs of the product as you have. So as new features are coming in, you have a better insight of what they are trying to do and then you can ask better questions. Other thing too is that get to know the company. Get to know really well the company you are working with. Uh, what are their goals? What they what what they are trying to reach? Um, and, and become and really, I mean, put it on the shirt and become a team player. And even this beyond your position, you may be able to to speak about things and bring your point of view just because people see you are so invested in the product, in the company. So that's what we all should be doing. And anyone who's listening to this for the first time, and whether you are in localization and you're interested in the UX perspective or vice versa, or in business and interested in this, get to know the other part. There are tons of articles, lots of, of uh, presentations and things out there. So just get to know more. That's how you're gonna be able to advocate is because you have more knowledge about the overall uh, picture. Great. Okay, let's uh, look at uh, questions from the audience. I think we have a couple uh, in the chat window and then a few more in the Q&A section. So I'll start here on the topic of um, uh, working with the product UX team uh, and the localization team, so collaboration. Uh, to that end, in your organization's how have you structured your cadence of communications slash meetings slash interactions to bring those teams together? And have you managed to communicate to everyone involved why this is important? So I think when you're, I think there's two different cases here. One is when you're working with a new product team and for us, so perhaps someone who has come in with an, an acquisition, that's where we have really become organized so that we, we reach out to them as a group um, of, of, of teams that are not the core part of the product team. We are uh, perhaps services that, that are available to them. We are the people who can help them understand what to do. And so we have a specific cadence of introducing the larger set of services um, and perhaps localization and product documentation would be a part of that. I think in terms of existing products, that's where it's really hard when you're reaching out to people who haven't been as open to you in the past, perhaps, you have to do the right thing for them. There's not a set cadence. You have to find out who, what part of the organization, is it product management? Is it engineering? Who holds the decision-making for that team? And, and approach that team appropriately. That's how I would start with the communication. Um, the other thing that I would add to, to what uh, Mimu was saying, you know, there's this acronym WIFM, that's uh, the radio station that everybody tunes into. What's in it for me? Uh, put yourself in the shoes of the other, of your stakeholders, identify what is critical, what is valuable to them, and see how you can help them. Because by helping them, you're making yourself, yourself useful and they are gonna be more uh, prone to bringing you into the, into the fold. And in doing that, I would totally advise, you know, uh, becoming a good storyteller. Identify three or four uh, anecdotes that you can share with people to, um, to tell them about, you know, the pitfalls or the opportunities in what they are doing. A few years ago, I was doing something different and you know, we were exercising an e-commerce site end-to-end. -end. And um, we actually went through the process of returning a product into the, into the company uh, in, in one of the markets. And you know, in, we have bought some, some big boxes, you know, like uh, uh, gaming devices, which are fairly hefty, and we tried to return them. And one of the things that we found out was that in one of the markets, Singapore, if memory, memory helps me, uh, the person who came, the courier, was actually a bicycle driver. And there was no way under heaven that the bicycle driver would be able to pick up a, a gaming device box and bring it to a storage facility. So that sparked a very good conversation about, hey, how do you account for uh, delivery services where everybody doesn't bring a truck by default. 
And that is a very good anecdote that I have used in, in uh, communicating with new stakeholders who may be wondering what is the value of what these people do. You paint a picture, you make it very tangible, and they say, okay, this person has got a good case, uh, or else they have some research, and I can relate to how that is going to help me not do duplicate work or, or redo work in the future. I can just add a, a simple perspective from our world uh, at PayPal. So I, I'm, I was thinking of the role of the design and uh, the content designer, so the content uh, writer. And I, I see them as being almost like the, 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 the center of this. Uh, you know, as they create, they're working hand in hand with the UX design team in our, in our model, in our, in our approach to how we create experiences they influence the UX designer completely. At the same time, they're also interacting with the linguist and with the localization team uh, and sharing you know, the progress of, of how content is being created and what it looks like in the UI. So I think, I was just thinking that, it, that role can, can you know, be critical to the success of the localization team as well. Like work with you know, the, the source content creator Bring, you know, lean on them and ask them, you know, when, when does this, uh, you know, when do we work together? How do we work together? Uh, we do have a cadence of communications and meetings that are kind of part of our process where we bring in the, the localization program managers and the localization experts to work with that content designer. Now, is the UX designer in that conversation? Probably not, right? If, if something is flagged, from a UX, UI design perspective by our content designer, yes, you know, they would be willing to come in and listen and, and you know, adjust the size of the button and whatever it may be, uh, or the icons they're using. Uh, but I, I see that role playing a huge uh, part in our approach, you know, to create that cadence of communications and visibility to the localization team. Uh, we have a few more questions from the audience. So one is, uh, how do you successfully sell UX localization to companies who balk at the high cost associated to not, not only with the initial project, but also the constant upkeep? So how do you convince people to do UX localization? Okay, I can take that one. Uh, as a, a contractor currently, um, I am the lowest in the food chain possibly but uh, what I does, what I did is that I um, once I start doing the work that I was hired to do, I start taking notes of, of of the patterns, and so as I was progressing with the the work I was in I was hired to do basically, I was creating on a side a case study that of all the things that I was seeing and all the patterns that were creating and issues that were either there or coming, right? So within a few weeks in the company, I asked to report what I have found. And then I create a presentation and I worked really hard on all the things I have found. I wrote all that I understood the, of the process. And then I suggested some things that could change. And I offered this presentation to my immediate supervisors and um, and this kind of escalated. It went up all the way up, I would say four or five levels above my head. And people came back to me and said, tell me more because they were not seeing what I saw and they were not making those connections because I was looking at things from multiple perspectives. So independent where you are in a company, whether you are in a higher level or in a very bottom, you always have, if you have something to say that will contribute to the company, you can put on a side and create your own case study of the company. I mean, this is something that was happening at the same time I was doing my job. So I didn't have to take time off to do this. And as you do this, you start advocating for new ideas and new processes and, and um, and new ways to fix gaps and, and issues that they had not seen it. And when they were catching on, it was like way later in the pro process because there was nobody hired to do this. They still don't, but I've been doing this 
I've been advocating and I've been telling them things that they know, don't know. So find what they don't know and then tell them and find out who you should tell them first and then try to get to the right people. Um, try to find the right stakeholders and then things will happen, right? So that's how everything works. If I may uh, uh, add a, a few more comments at the end of the day, you know, it's all a matter of ROI. And for that, you have to begin with the end in mind. You know, what is the, what is the ultimate goal of the product or service that you're working on? And that's typically, uh, in some cases, profit, in other cases, distribution of information, depending on your product. So be very clear about uh, the ultimate goal of your, of your enterprise, and then present a viable case of how these activities can help you achieve that goal. If your goal is uh, to get more dollars, then you know it's a matter of uh, the opportunity cost. Do you want to invest in marketing in, say, the United States? Or do you think that uh, uh, by providing um, uh, localization in, in uh, Canada or, say, the Philippines, you're going, to, you're going to be able to grow your market? And you know you can you can look at the relative ROIs, and in doing that, again, use uh, whatever resources and research is available to you. Um, we were talking about this paper that you guys have put together. There's also a very interesting study by Pricewaterhouse uh, Coopers, which is the world by 2050, which projects where uh, GDP is going to grow between now and 2050, which is only. Um, which is only 30 years away. And you know they are saying that uh, the largest GDP countries by GDP in the world are gonna be China, the United States, uh, India, and then Indonesia. So if you use that macro trend, you know that can help you inform and nudge your organization along to think about, hey, you know, if that's where the users and the dollars are going to grow, the dollars or the rupees, as the case may be, what are we doing to position our product for growth in the future. And that becomes a very, a very exciting conversation because again, if uh, you're approaching this as I'm a cost, I'm a toll gate that you have to go through, people will tend to shy away and, uh, from you and avoid you. If you're thinking about, you know, this is our goal and this is how I can help you meet and exceed that goal, people are gonna be more excited to partner with you. Great. Um, Moving on a bit here, we have a couple of questions still, some more coming in. So one big topic, future looking topic, AI. So what role does AI play in terms of hyper personalization with the customer experience? If any of you have looked at that. AI is outside of my scope as of now. I have looked into some things just as a curiosity. And one thing that um, I see that I thought was very interesting was I, I read a study that said um, if you if you try to have your uh, chatterbox speak to the customer in the same tone as your company persona, let's use the example of flow and progressive. You know, she's kind of quirky, she's kind of funny. Um, so you, it's a big risk because. Yes, you may be kind of communicating brand and communicating that brand persona, but it may not be what the person on the other end talking to the chatterbox is expecting. So while there is a level of personalization that needs to be done, you need to think about uh, when do you stop that personalization, either as the representation of the company or um, how the, the user expect to be talked to when they know they are talking to a robot. You know, this is a robot, you're not my best friend. So don't try to talk to me as I am your best friend. So there's a fine line on those. And there are many, many good studies out there if, if you're more interested in, but I haven't worked with that. I have, uh, I'm interested. So I, I, I read a lot about it. I think this is an area that depends so much on the industry that people are in. And so I've talked to some people in the game industry who have done really interesting things around this because they can track exactly what their users have, are doing and the experiences that they present to them can be so customized to the user. Um, 
I think the chat box is probably the in in my enterprise software world. It's the closest thing that we get to having something um, that's informed by AI. But we're not at the point where we can collect enough data yet to really know each of our users. And so much is um, is also held back. I won't say held back, but it's defined by by privacy rules. And so that's um, that's one area where I think things are gonna have to shift a bit for us to really make changes in that direction. One if of the we... things that makes me, oh, sorry. Yeah, one of ahead. the things that makes me think about in AI is also voice command because it's kind of like the same kind of ball game. And uh, we, we see more and more because of all our, our um, our devices in my house is we are surrounded by Google and Alexa and all these different things because my husband loves those things. I keep waiting for him to bring one that will do the dishes. I haven't found that one yet. But um, so, but voice interaction and AI are very um, correlated. So how we talk to these instruments. So you need to think that when you're talking about uh, communication with a, a, a device, it has to be a simpler communication. You cannot ask deep and complex questions because the bot's not gonna be able to answer it as of now. It will be scary when they start telling you, having very humanized conversation. But um, voice is another thing to think about AI and how we are gonna deal with it as far as localization and what kind of voices we will have in each different culture as we talk to those devices. I think the one point that comes to mind uh, in terms of AI is that, you know, you obviously want to approach language localization from an overall customer's perspective, right? What are what is the average customer's, you know, preference uh, and need around uh, language uh, localization on this topic? But I think there's an opportunity there to take it to that next level, which is in places where you can create delight, in places where you can use AI to solve for things in a proactive way when things go wrong. You know, there's a lot that can be done that can, uh, you know, really facilitate that experience that customers are having with your brand at the right moment, right? And then the other point that I'm fascinated by the topic and these, uh, I've got a book club at PayPal and we, we, we are digging into it, but um, the one thing that comes to mind always is the, is the bias, right? In terms of how these language models historically have come through in terms of a gender bias and a racial bias. So, you know, these models have been, you know, trained by humans. And so obviously the bias that exists in society is reflected in these AI models. So how do we keep an eye out for that and continuously clean up these models to make sure that we're not perpetuating um, racial bias and gender bias. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I want to ask you as well, Pedro, on this topic, because you, you re represent a team that works with news, right? It seems like an area that would be ripe for hyper-personalization. Yeah, yeah, I'm not a specialist in this area. We do combine machine curation or machine machine learning to choose the right pieces of content that different users will see with human curations to look after the topics that uh, that uh, we believe that uh, everybody everybody should hear about, um, and and uh, you know this this is something that we have been doing for uh, some time. I think that um, in our case we're looking to maximize engagement with our product, so the algos are are fairly fairly automated. You know, there's two basic phases of exploration. You know, what do people uh, in general like to consume and you try multiple things and based on, on the trends and what we know about you as a user, then we can customize the experience for you. I think that uh, um, in this panel, I would echo the, the, the comment that Pushpinder was making. Uh, the important thing is um, the ethical aspects of, of artificial intelligence and the, the, the biases that may be brought into products. And, you know, as 
stewards of the global experience, it's important for us to make sure that uh, when people build AI systems, they're thinking about the world in general. And that talks about uh, languages, that talks about uh, voices, that talks about uh, body types. Uh, and those should all be brought into, into the consideration when building products. Excellent. So I'm going to squeeze one more question in there. Actually, combine two questions into one. Uh, we and it's a pretty practical question. So practical advice uh, from you guys. So what skills do you believe localization specialists should have? And are there any courses or books about localization slash UX design you would recommend? I don't want to be the one always answering. <laughs> <laughs> you start out. I, <laughs> I just talk too much. Well, one of the things um, that has been helpful, it has been asking around people in the industry. So um, if you're looking for um, just overall knowledge, check in Coursera, edx.org. Um, even local community colleges, they, they have courses in either localization or UX. It's harder to find those two things combined, right? Uh, I think there's a few people who are uh, putting those things together and there are a few articles, there are scholarly articles, but there's not books per se. Um, I would recommend if that's, you just want something quick, just look into those. Uh, University of Washington has tremendous uh, localization course. If you're interested in, in investing a little bit more and a little bit more time, it's about nine months training. I, um, I actually doing it one with them because I'm always doing continuing education. Um, and then just keep looking for, go to LinkedIn and ask people. That's what I do. I go to LinkedIn and I see people who are doing interesting things and I ask questions and usually I get very good answers. In fact, yeah, there will be questions that will not be answered here. And if I can help with anyone, just contact me and we'll go from there. I, I, I agree, Adriana. I have seen that there are a number of books on, um, and I, I, I'm not going to vouch for any of them. I'm just going to say, you know, search Amazon.com for localization and UX, and you'll bring up some things about the multicultural experience. I also think that it's really valuable to go, I'm coming at it from the localization side, but for example, localization institute courses or some of the, um, some of the, the major uh, conferences that we have, because it's not about what, the, what exactly is being discussed there, but it's about the conversations you have with other professionals in your area. And that's where I, th I find the conversations of course, we're all virtual now, but the conversations between sessions are the ones where you meet the people. That's where I might meet someone in a different field coming together with the interest and, and share that kind of information. I, I would and, say, uh, just, go ahead, <clears throat> push Pinder. Uh, just quickly advocating for some UX uh, design resources and to wrap your head around the human-centered design process. So there's IDEO, uh, which offers a lot of uh, freebies on their website. It's a design agency. Um, they also have like these little certificate programs that help you understand the human-centered design process. Uh, I was just trying to remember the website I go to always when I have a question about UX, and that's the Nielsen Norman Group's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just their, their space on user experience is very detailed, lots of great articles. Uh, when in doubt, you know, I go there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are just from a UX perspective. Go ahead, Pedro. Yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, interestingly enough, uh, the, the traditional localization space is, is evolving very fast. Translation is a problem for which there exists a solution. So, you know, I would advocate for people to move away from translation as a, as a core function because, um, you know, that problem is fairly well understood and, and, and organized. And, you know, for people in this industry, other than translators, and I foresee two parts, you can either become a, a workflow machine translation specialist where you're building the systems that automatically detect changes in, in the code and then 
facilitate integration with industry standard tools, whether that's translation memory, machine translation, you name it. So that part of uh, uh, workflow building, or else you think about product management and UX. How do you how do you help the product be more successful on a, on a on a global scale? I see I see the industry moving in those two directions. And then you know, as the sitting chairperson of Gala, I would totally recommend that people join the globalization and localization association it's a very good deal fifteen hundred dollars for your organ uh, seventeen hundred actually one time uh, uh, for everybody in your organization and you will be surrounded by people in 400 plus different organizations from clients um, to uh, universities and, and uh, training uh, and academic institutions to uh, people in the LFP system and I will stop after my plug. I have one more comment on the skill side. Um, just, just wanted to mention, I wish I could get more data scientists who, who, or localization people who knew more about data science, because that's one area where I think we need, we need more people to know what to do with our data, how, how to get it and what should be important to us. So. For sure. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I have a bunch of other questions, but we might just have to write another white paper or do this another time again. I really appreciate your time. Uh, appreciate your time. Thank you, panelists and everyone for, uh, for attending and your questions and so on. Uh, but I'll leave it at that for today. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thank you.